dice game, and I think we got it working. And our next job is to refactor it. And again, the idea of refactoring is that you take code that works and, and you make it better in some way. And better usually means um, more reusable, more maintainable. All right, that's usually what we mean, mean when we speak of something being uh, better code. All right, um, so let's talk about our dice game for a minute. Let's imagine that um, we were a site that had a bunch of games on it. It's not inconceivable to say that we might have several dice games on our site, right? You know, Yahtzee, Craps, whatever, all right? Now, the rules of the game might be different. All right, you know, each game has different rules, you know. Yahtzee has five dice, uh, Craps also has two dice, and so on and so forth. But there's certain functionality that uh, are common for dice, all right? We could even extend that if we wanted to and say, what about games that have more than six-sided dice? You know, the Dungeons and Dragons and all that kind of thing, of which I know of but don't know anything about, all right, really. Uh, now, for those, we could, we, you know, the, the behavior of those dice are very similar to a six-sided dice. There's just a few different parameters, you know, the, the number of options that you have are, are different under one versus the other. So the thought is that it would be great if we could put all our code that deals with dice in one spot, all right? so that anyone that needed to use the code for dice didn't have to reinvent the wheel. All right? Now again, we're doing dice here. Dice are pretty basic. There's only a few things that you can do with them. All right? But the same thought would apply for other sort of like business type issues. In fact, they typically call these like business logic. All right? I prefer the term problem domain logic. In other words, things that are part of the problem that you're trying to solve. So if we're trying to write games, dice is part of that problem domain, if we're trying to write dice games. All right? So imagine something like a shipping calculation. You know, shipping calculation can be complex, how to get something from point A to point B. Right? There can be different options of which carrier you're going to use. There could be different options of how quickly you want it. Uh, in some cases, um, I worked on an application for a chemical, um, what would you say, a supplier, uh, a company that supplied chemicals to uh, research labs. And in some cases, like if the chemicals are hazardous, that's, there's a whole other set of issues, all right, about like where you can ship to, you know, you can't ship certain things to a P.O. box, for example, or whatever. And... Um, our application even dealt with like shipping to Europe and in other countries, whereas the laws might be different. You know, if you're shipping hazardous uh, chemicals to a certain country, there were only like certain places you could send it. All right. So really, honestly, the person we had like a three or four person, I think a four person team on this. One person was devoted just to handling the shipping calculation. All right. Now. If you're going to spend that much time working on some business logic or business rules, you don't want to do it twice, right? You want to put it somewhere so that any place in the application where you need to do it, you can do it. So you want to make a little component that is similar to the ASP.NET components, but for your particular problem, right? ASP.NET components are components that any sort of web application is likely to use. Any web application is likely to do validation, all right? Any web application is likely to do database interactivity. Many web applications are likely to have a calendar on it. So these are all components that sort of cross over all these different sorts of web applications. It doesn't matter what you're doing, there's a good chance that you're going to use a lot of these sort of things. Now, and again, that's what a framework should do, give you a building point to, you know, give you a starting point, a framework that you can build on top of so you don't have to start from the ground up. You, you sort of have a starting point. And that's what, that's what these uh, components um, um, allow you to do. And what's the advantage of using these components? 
Well, it saves you some work, because rather than you writing validation, you simply use a validation control. All right? Chances are that validation control has been thoroughly tested. And if everyone uses the same sort of ASP.NET controls, you're going to guarantee some level of consistency in your application. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you could write code to validate an email address, for example. And there might be little, little holes in all of those methods or little quirks about how they handle certain things differently. Well, if everyone's using the same component to validate email, all right, then it's going to work consistently. So our goal is to create reusable components, but reusable components for our little problem domain, the kind of things we're trying to solve. And in this case, the first component that we're going to try to create is for dice. All right? We're going to put in, we're going to try to create uh, a component for the dice because there's a good chance that somewhere else, all right, we're going to need code to do dice if we create a Yahtzee game or if we create a craps game or whatever. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a component to handle the functionality of the dice. All right. That will be the first thing we do. And then after we get that done, we'll, we'll see how much time we have left and, and decide what to do next. All right. Again, do not repeat yourself, DRY. I think I mentioned that in class before. Anytime you see code that looks repetitive, should strike an alarm in your head. All right, that, hey, maybe I can do this better somehow. All right, so let's go and look at what we have and let's review it because we have a good example of a simple app, simple web app, that plays a game and it works and it's not horrible. You know, we could improve the UI a little bit and we could maybe do a little more error checking, although I think we did add error checking in the last iteration, uh, or validation rather. But let's, let's take a look at that and then we can move to the next phase. All right, if you could hit the lights. Choice. 
we make the choice, it tells us if we've won or lost. Please make choice. I picked it. I want low. Click the button. It tells me I lost. Let's go for seven. Lost again. If we don't, if we make the non-choice, it tells us that we must make a selection and doesn't doesn't roll. All right. What we've done so far in this class is to sort of understand what's at work here when we talk about a server-side scripting, when we talk about um, pages that are created on the fly by the web server based on certain things that the, that the user has typed in, based on random things, based on other things. And we've talked about the ASP.NET components. So let's take a minute to review those. In our ASPX page itself, which again is the UI, it's analogous to the HTML. In fact, it is in part HTML. ASPX pages are a mix of HTML and ASP.NET server controls. Those server controls get translated into HTML. So for example, this drop down list. All right. That's an ASP.NET drop-down list. Well, there's no such thing as an ASP uh, drop-down list in HTML. There's a select with options. So this guy here gets translated into a select with options. However, we can code, we can write code for that component and access and manipulate the attributes of it. So. Stuff that isn't ASP.NET controls is just plain old HTML. There's a title, no translation necessary. That's the title of the page. The server returns that HTML. But these other things are used um, because we want to do something dynamic with them, typically. All right, we want to access their values and, and use the values from them to do something. All right. In this case, these images, we want to set the value of those images uh, based on the roll of the dice. All right. There's a separation here. This is a user interface. All right. We've put our code in a separate file. And remember we did that. We said we wanted to do that when we first created the app to say, I believe when we first created it, either when we first created the app or actually when we created this page, we had an option, and we said, yes, put the code in a separate file. So one thing that you see a lot in programming is the idea of having little pieces of code that do one thing that all work together. So you could write this where all the C-sharp code was part of the ASPX page, but that would make it confusing. All right. In addition, if someone was really an expert in HTML, you might give them the AXPX pages to code, while as someone who was a sharp coder who wasn't that well versed in design or HTML or CSS, avoided that and worked on the C sharp stuff. Okay, code behind file. This is actually the processing of that. We have one event. Well, repeating code, not a good thing. No more repeating code. All right. That's a sign that, you know, something's wrong. We might be able to rewrite this, refactor this to do um, a, a better job. All right. So, what I'm 
I'm going to do to start out with is I'm going to make a class for a single die. All right, one die, two dice. Okay. And what does it mean when I say I'm going to make a class? A class, when you hear class, think a component. All right? Think a component. Think of it as a template. All right? In other words, we're going to put in our dice class or in our die class everything that a die can do. And every characteristic the die has. All right? So what are, what's something that you can do with a die? You can roll it. All right? So there's going to be something in our class that allows us to roll a die. All right? Generate a Pardon me? Generate a random number. And you, exactly. And it will generate a random number, and it will return to the outside world, this is what I rolled. Okay. A couple other things that a die, uh, about a die. A die can tell you what its current value is. So I roll it, get a five. A couple minutes later, I can ask, gee, what, what's your number? You know, what's your value? And it can tell me, well, it's a five. Third thing that it can do is it can tell you what image to use. All right. How to visually represent it. It can tell you, hey. I rolled a six and my image is contained in this file. So we're going to put that code somewhere because we don't want that code spread around in all the different pages that we have that play dice games. Right now, this is the code that rolls the dice. This is the code that gives me the name of the image. All right. If I wrote a different dice game on a different page, I'd have to duplicate that code. Now, dice are pretty static, if you will. In other words, not much has changed about the way dice work since the day they were invented. But other business sort of processes like um, shipping calculations or tax calculations or anything like that is subject to change. All right, and therefore, if we go through a lot of work to create the code to do that, we don't want to have to duplicate it. All right, we want to put it in one place so that anyone that needs that code can use it. Just like the ASP.NET framework has put everything about validation in one place so that we can just use that component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class. All right. A little bit of terminology. When I say a class, a class is meant to mean a template for some entity within our problem. It's going to have all the characteristics and, uh, and all the behaviors associated with that entity. So, for example, if we were doing an application for a school, all right, there might be a student class. Well, what are all the things associated with students? Well, students have names. Students have student ID numbers. Students have majors. Students can enroll in classes. Students can drop a class. Students receive grades. Students graduate. Students try to register for classes, and so on. All that stuff we would build into one student component. So that anywhere we wanted to use a student in our application, anything that you could do for a use with a student would be available in our application. And it would live in one place. All right? Take something like calculate GPA. All right? There's a method that you use to calculate GPA. You know, you take your grade, you multiply it by the credit hours, you know, then you divide by the total credit hours, and that's more or less your GPA, if I'm not mistaken. All right? It's not hard, but if that code was 
in a couple different places, there's a possibility that it could be done inconsistently. So when you go to graduate, there may be one calculation of your GPA versus when you go to register for a class, there might be another calculation for your GPA. That's not a good idea. You don't want inconsistencies within your application. You want that calculation to live in one place. So that any place that needs to calculate a student's GPA can call that component and ask for the student's GPA and it will give it to them. Then you only have to get that right once, right? Every person that deals with students doesn't have to write their own routine to calculate GPA. They just have to use the student component and call that method. Now, there could be a mistake in it, right? There could be a bug in it. Someone coded that a little bit wrong. But the nice thing is, is if you fix that bug, there's only one place to fix it in, all right? Or the rules could change. For example, right now here at LC, um, you know, you just get letter grades, A, B, C, D, and F, right? They could change the rules at some point and say that you can get pluses and minuses. So you can get an A plus, an A, an A minus. Well, that would change the way that you calculate a GPA, right? Because an A plus would count differently than an A or an A minus, all right? So if they were today to say, you know, starting now there's going to be, um, you know, the ability to give A's, A pluses, A minuses, and so on down the line, it's not that there's a bug in the GPA calculation. It's that the rules of the business have changed. The rules of the organization have changed. Therefore, you would have to go and rework that routine. Well, it would be great if you only had to do that once, right? Do not repeat yourself. That you didn't have to track down all the code that existed everywhere within your application where the GPA was calculated and revise that. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a component, not for students and GPA, but we're going to uh, create a component for DICE. So DICE has a handful of things that it can do, right? Um, a, the DICE can roll, all right? And the DICE can tell you the image that belongs with it. And the DICE can tell you its value if you've asked for it. So let's go and let's create a class for dice and then we'll drop that into this code. One of our goals that's always going to be a goal is the code that handles the user interface shouldn't do anything with like the business logic or the problem domain logic. In other words, the rules of the game, the behavior of the dice, are built into this button roll click event. All right? That's not good. All right? And it's not good for all those reasons that I said. We want to keep these methods, these click handlers, being very lean. All right? All they do is they connect the user interface with the classes that do the real work, all right, and then return the results. So I'm going to create a component for a die. So I'll go up here and say file, new, file. And I'm going to create a class. an empty class declaration. <coughs> and I'm going to give this class a meaningful name. Please give it a meaningful name. Don't leave it at class one. I'm not sure if I'll deduct points. It might depend on what mood I'm in if you leave it at class one. But it will make me sad if you leave it at class one. All right. And as a general rule, it's better if your professor is happy when they're grading your work as opposed to being sad. All right, 
So I'm going to call this die, which sounds ominous, but it is in fact one die. Right? One dice is called a die. So I'm going to click that and add. And it is telling me that I probably want to put it in the app code folder, which I'm going to say yes to. So now it creates sort of a blank template for this class. And we can put code in here, uh, comments in here, and so on to um, explain what this class is for. I'm not going to do that in the interest of time. All right. Within the class, we can define two things. We can define attributes, characteristics, and we can define methods or functions. Every class is comprised of those two things. And methods, yeah. Another way to say it would be characteristics and functions. It's like there's values, and then there's like calculations or processes. So, for example, a student's name is simply a value, right? There's no like calculation you go to to look at their birth date and do some math and figure out what their name is, right? Their name's their name. It's just a value. So that's an attribute. Something like GPA, that's a method. All right. In other words, there's a process to go through to calculate that. How many credits a student earns? That's a method. There's a process to calculate that. You go through, look through all the classes they've taken. You've looked to see which ones they've withdrawn and so on and so forth. And then you can do a calculation and say, yeah, this student has earned 45 credit hours or whatever. So methods are things that are like calculations or, or processes. All right. Whereas attributes are simply characteristics. All right. We're going to have one attribute and we're going to have a couple methods. All right. At least a couple methods. First thing we have is an attribute. Attributes will go here, right after that first brace. And this is the things that the dice knows about itself. The dice, and again, we, you know, we use those terms loosely. Obviously, no one is claiming here that the dice has some sort of self-awareness. But it's a characteristic of the dice, uh, of the die. Is that, yeah, well, it's character, one of the characteristics of it is and knows what its value is. All right. Now, how is that value determined? It's determined when you roll the dice. All right. I'm going to take this out because we're not going to use it in this example, and we can get rid of it. Public int roll. Okay. What does that mean? Public means that it is a function that other objects can call, other classes can call it. All right. We'll talk a little bit more about private and public in a, a few minutes here. Because if you notice the value of the die, I made private. Okay. Well, what happens when you roll a dice? All right. Well, we kind of have that code already. Take that. All right. 
number generator. I generate a random value from between 1 and 6. All right. And then I return the value. Now, the return value has to match what I've said it is up here. So public int roll. This tells me if other classes can call this method, which we want to have happen. This tells me the type of return value, which in this case is an integer, because that's what you get when you roll a dice, right? You get an, an integer from 1 to 6. And this is the name of the function. Now included in the parentheses would be any arguments that the function would have. All right? Uh, arguments are parameters that you can give the function for the function to do its job. Um, when we roll a dice, all we do is we roll it. We don't like have to tell the dice something before we roll it or something like that. I don't know. It's kind of hard to think of an analogy in this situation. All right. So what does this function do? Generates a random number. Stores the results in value, in that attribute, and then it returns a value. All right. It returns a value so that whoever rolled the dice knows what it rolled. All right. Whoever calls this function doesn't need to know the details of how it works. All right. There could be all sorts of in this case, it's pretty straightforward, but there could be all sorts of things that happen when you roll a dice. All right. If you were writing a game, you could make it sort of rig the dice if the person had lost a bunch of times in a row. Right? No one likes to lose a game over and over and over again. Then the game becomes not interesting. You could actually write comp complex code in here that would look at how often the user has been winning and rig the deck in their favor if you wanted to. All right? Kind of like some games sort of adjust their AI based on how good you are. Right? If you're really good, it'll make it harder for you. If you're not so good, it'll make it easier for you. All right? And again, why is that? Well, that, that's what keeps games interesting. Right? If, if you have no chance at winning a game, it's not interesting. If you can win all the time without even really trying, that's not interesting either. All right? That sort of challenge of like, well, if I do well, I win. If not, I lose. That's what makes games interesting. At any rate, my point is, is whatever process is going through to, to roll the dice, you do it. All right? And in this case, we're simply dealing with the simple kind of dice that only has six sides. So that constitutes giving a random number and returning it. Now, I'm going to create another function here that says public string. All right. Public means the outside world can call it. String means that it's going to return a string. Get image name. And there's no arguments. Alright? We're simply going to look at the value and return the name of the image that corresponds to that value of dice. So let's go here and look. What was our rule? Well, Determine the name of the 
image that belongs to this dice? Well, the name is, the file name is images slash D, whatever the value of the dice is, the images are D1 through D6, and a PNG on the end. And that's what I'm returning. So I've taken the behavior that I'm interested in about dice and I've put it in one place. All right. Now, I'm ready to go and use this component instead of having the rules coded in my example. So, I'm going to do this. I'm going to create instances of my die class. Remember that a class defines how a whole category of things behave. Every die in the world works that way, right? That when you roll it, it randomly comes up with a number from 1 to 6. And here is the image that belongs to that die. Every die in the world fits that. So the class is meant to be sort of a generic description of how every member of that class behaves. Every student has the same formula for calculating their GPA. All right? Every student here at, at this college. There might be variations at other colleges, right? But every student here has the same method for calculating the GPA. Now the values are going to be different because you've taken different classes and gotten different grades and so on. But every student, there's one method to do that. Just like there's one method to roll a dice and all that. Now, in a game like this, we actually need two dice. Right? We need two specific dice. So we're going to create two die objects. An object represents a member of the class. All right? In other words, by creating two die, effectively, we're saying, oh yeah, okay, this is what dice do. Let's make two of them. Let's make two actual dice. Another example, getting, going back to the student example. The class is student. All right? The student class has code that represents everything that a student can do and every characteristic of that student. So the student class contains a student name, a student major, a method to get the GPA, a method to tell if they, how many credit hours they've earned, a method to see if they are eligible to graduate, and so on and so forth. All right? Now, Each one of you would represent a student object because you're a member of that class. You're a member of the class of student. So you're going to have specific values to all those things. You're going to have your own name, your own student ID number, your own major. When I calculate GPA, I'm going to get the answer for you if I ask your student object, what's your GPA? If I say, how many credit hours do I have? I'm going to get that value for you. So the class defines a sort of generic process. The object is the individual item. All right? We need to roll two dice to get our answer. So we create two dice objects, and then we're going to roll them. All right. What this line says is, is take the class die, make a new die, and store the result in a variable called die one. So die one is now a die object, just like b one up here is a boolean. User choice is an int. 
D1 is an ant, and so on. Die 1 is actually a die. Now, how do I roll that die? Die 1 dot roll. Yeah. D1 equals die 1 dot roll. Now, above that, the die is the class? Yes. That's the class. That should correspond to the name of the file and the name that we define the class as. So each of these, they're both dies, but they're different dies. In other words, it's not like we're rolling one die and using its value twice. We're rolling two separate dies that can have two separate values. All right. So what does this do in a nutshell? This calls the roll method on die one and returns the result and stores it in the variable called d1. Okay. So I'm going to call this method. I'm going to generate my random value and I'm going to return that value. Whatever I return is going to get put into d1. Same thing for D2. I'm going to roll it again. Oops. I'm going to roll the second die and store the value in D2. Now again, this might not necessarily look like a gigantic improvement, but it is. All right? It is because I've removed that knowledge about what it takes to roll a dice, and I've put it in one place. So every single place that I need to use a die, I'm calling the same code. And again, if it helps you to think of this as like calculate GPA or calculate shipping cost or something like that, something more complicated, yeah, this, this could be more than just a couple lines of code, that method. There could be big, gigantic methods that go through a lot of things before it finally comes up with an answer. But here, we are going and we are uh, rolling the die, we're stuffing the result in D1 and D2, and then the rest of the process can continue until we get here. And we can say, I one die get image name I two die get image name. Oops. term is used in object-oriented programming and design is encapsulation. All right. What do we mean by encapsulation? It means everything about an entity lives in one place. All right. Before, the behaviors of the dice lived in this on-click event. And if we were to wrote another program to roll a dice, we would have our own on-click event, and we would have to put that code in there. Now, we can just call that dice and function and do our thing. So let's make, we're not going to do the rules for Yahtzee, but you know, Yahtzee, you roll five dice, okay? Let's see how easy it is to do that now. But let's make a second page that does Yahtzee, and we'll just do the rolling of the five dice. All right, we won't, we won't do anything beyond that. So I'll go new, file, new, file. I'll probably 
could get a call from someone's copyright lawyers because Yahtzee's probably a trademark. But place code in a separate file. It, we, it is when you create that, and we always want to do that because we want a nice separation. And using it for educational purposes. Very good. Fair use applies. Thank you. All right. Let me go here on this page, and I'm going to put five images and a button. So I put my button. And let me put my five images. Don't judge me. I'm not changing the names on any of them. So, there's five of them. All right, on my button click event, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create five instances of the dice because I need five actual dice to put in here. All right? Yes. So, die, die one equals new die. This is the name of the object. Another, another way to put it is it's an instance of that class. It's a specific die. And we'll do this five times. I can roll them all. Finally, I can say image one dot image URL equals die one dot get image name. Here we go. All, right. All we're doing is we're calling methods on those objects. We're not doing any of the work ourselves. We're not generating the random numbers. We're asking the dice to go roll yourself. All right. We're asking the dice, what's your um, image? What's the image name associated with you? So, none of that logic is in the on-click event. The on-click event is simply going to be the glue between the user interface and our business logic classes. So, if I go and run this guy, same 
class every time they're all done. You know what that sounds stupid. Well, well, does it do it here? Do we have that problem in the other one? Yeah, it seems like we do. It's coming up with the same random number each time, which leads me to believe. What if you're just like super lucky? Or I'm super lucky. Yeah. <laughs> you're storing it in the same value every time, aren't you? Mm, yes, but remember, each die will have its own copy of those variables. The problem is, is the way that I'm generating the random value. In other words, if I go here, let's debug it, right? Let's not guess. Let's debug. All right? So I'm going to go and actually, I'm going to go way back here because I think I know the answer to this, but I want to pretend that I don't. Okay? So I'm going to go and I'm going to put my breakpoint there. All right, then I'm going to run this page. If it turns out that there is no bug in the code, I am going to skip lab and see if there's any, like, for money Yahtzee tournaments online. <laughs> All right, I click the button. I'm there, All right? I'm seeing what's going on. All right? Now, I, I'm, I'm pretty reasonable, uh, I can pretty reasonably say that nothing is going on there. I'm going to say step over. Step over means don't go into the method that's being called. So I'm going to go step over. All right, here's where I think I'm having an issue. Which method do we think is wrong? Which method could be wrong? I, I, I'm, 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 not express, I'm not expressing myself very well. It could be the get image name. It could be the role method, right? We don't know that yet. I have an idea, but like I always like to tell myself, if your code isn't working, don't get all smart and say, I know the problem is with this. Because if you were that smart, your code would be working, right? So if you don't know why, if it isn't working, then don't be so sure that you know exactly why it isn't working. So it could be the role is always given to me the same value. Or it could be that the image is always giving me the same um, image, no matter what I roll. All right? So I'm going to say step into this, because I want to see what's going on inside that roll. So if I stepped over, it wouldn't show me that. So I'm going to say step into. All right, here we are. Step into, into, into. And we can look and we can see the value of the die is 4. All right. Locals, this is the object itself. RND is the random object that I've created. So I roll the 4. All right. And I return. I'm going to step into again. Let's look at this. I rolled a five. The plot thickens. I have to say, this is unexpected. I rolled a one. Why does this 
why is why why are you gonna insult me? <laughs> <laughs> seems reasonable. Okay. Now I'm going to go into here. Image URL equals die one dot get image. This really could be this really could be an unusual sort of situation here. This should be a four. That's a four. Right? That's what it is, right? Images d4 dot png. Right. That's going to go to that. And that goes and sets that image one URL. And we could find image one. It's probably this guy here after we execute that. Maybe not. Oh, yeah, there we go. That's the image URL. So we set it to D4. Returns D5. I'm pretty sure it was 5, right? Yeah, At least it ain't 4. It's not 4. <laughs> yeah. All right, this, in other words, this page, image 2. Image, all right. One. Six. And then one. Okay, so the code worked. Uncertainty principle. Is anyone familiar with that? As long as you observe something, the waveform collapses and there and it changes. Okay. The all right, very good. All right. Now, the upshot of that, the portion of that is relative, uh, that is relevant rather, is that observing something changes it. So we ran it through the debugger. Previously, we weren't running it through the debugger. Okay, so we may get slightly different results. I have I've seen this happen before, and I think that it's happening again. Let's prove to ourselves. Let's close out of this. Let's get rid of the breakpoints. Let's get rid of the breakpoint and let's run it again. All fours again. Okay, let me tell you what I think is happening. And this is just based on the fact that I have been programming for 200 plus years. All right. The random number generator is. It, the, the manner in which the random number generator is being called is giving me uh, the same number each time. Therefore, I'm going to use the other method for generating a random number, which is
you're going to create a more, if you're going to create more than one random number, you should keep the same random instance and reuse it. If you create new instances too close in time, they'll produce the same series of random numbers. So what's happening is that the manner in which the random number generator works, because we're bang, 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 rolling five dice real quickly in a row, the random number generator is seeded by the time. So therefore, because I'm generating a group of random numbers closely in time, that object will um, return the same thing. So what is the workaround for that? Create a timer in between. No. I don't want to slow my app down. And, and yeah, I don't want to do that. What I'm going to do is this, and I don't expect you to follow this, but I'm going to say, See now. Yay. <laughs> All right. Let me explain to you what happened. There really is, and again, you know, there really is no such thing as a random number. Random numbers are generated usually by some algorithm that involves looking at the time. All right? And that's known as the random number seed. And then you start generating random numbers based on some algorithm after that. So the idea is if I were to do it now and do it and come back 8 o'clock tonight and do it again, the time's different, so it's going to generate a different set of random numbers. However, in the case of the code I had, I was rolling a dice five times in rapid fire succession, and each time I was creating a new random number generator. So it got seeded each time with the time, which was very close to each other. So it generated the same sequence of random numbers. How did I fix that? I created what's called a static variable. A static variable is a variable for which there is not one value per instance or one value per object, but one value per class. All right? So in other words, int value is the value of the dice, right? Every dice has its own value, all right? So that needs to be what's called an instance variable. That random number generator, though, we don't want every dice to have its own random number generator because then we run into the problem that we were running into before. We want instead every die in our system 
to share the same random number generator. So it will generate a unique set of numbers each time as opposed to like it did before and repeating it. So what happened when we were in debug? Why did it work in debug? Because I was taking a lot of time. And again, a lot of time in computer terms is a lot different than a lot of time in people terms. Just the fact, even if I wasn't stopping to explain things at different points in time, just the fact that I had to press the F10 or F11 or whatever to go to the next statement was long enough for when the next random number was generated, it used a different time to seed it and therefore gave me a different result. Okay. So that's kind of a puzzling error. All right. Um, but even if you don't understand it completely, I hope you've got the bigger issue about creating a class. And that class then becomes a component that you can use in a variety of places and so on. If you, um, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess that's it. Um, you know, if you're going to do something to include randomization, make that random variable a static variable um, as opposed to making it a instance variable. How do you make it a static variable? Just put the word static um, before the data type. All right. Boy, that turned out to be a fun lecture. <laughs> fun for me, anyhow. I hope it was fun for you. All right. We'll see you over in lab.